In this video, I'm going to go over an example of how to use the Miller-Rabin primality test. But before I do that, I want to go over briefly what it is. So, as implied in the name, it is a primality test. However, that's a bit of a misnomer since it doesn't really test if something is prime, it tests if it's not prime, if it's composite. So what I mean by that is, if we run the test and it says, yes, this number is prime, what it really means is, yes, this number is probably prime. We're almost sure, but we're not completely sure. Um, so, however, if we run the test and it says this number is composite, what it's telling us is, yes, this number is for sure composite. This number is definitely not prime. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're running this test. Okay, so now there are three steps that I've broken this down into, and I'm going to explain how to do them as I work an example. So in our example, I want to know is 53 prime. So step one, I want to find n minus one equals two to the k times m. Okay, first of all, n is 53. n is the number that we are testing. It's the number in question. So 53 minus one equals two to the k times m. We want to know what is k and what is m. Oh, and also um, k and m need to be whole numbers. Okay, so how we're going to do this, find k and m, is we're going to take this, um, which is 52 or 53 minus one, and we're going to start by dividing it by two to the power one, which obviously is 26. So next, we're going to do the same thing. Take our 52, again, I got my 52 from here, n minus one. Only this time, we're going to um, take the exponent up one notch, right here, two to the power two. This will be 13. So I'm going to do it again. Two to the power three. This is 6.5. All right, this is where we stop, because as you can see, 6.5 is not a whole number. That's not what we want. So we came to one that's not whole. We take the one before that. This is what we're looking for. So if I take what I have here and I rearrange it, you can see that I could say that 52 equals 2 squared times 13. Now, if you recall, what we were asking was 52 needs to equal 2 to the power k times m. So we can see we have accomplished that goal, and we found that k is 2 and m is 13. So that is step 1. Step 2, I need to pick an a. So a needs to be greater than 1, but less than n minus 1. So in our case, a needs to be in between, um, needs to be in between 2 and 51. I'm going to pick, um, a equals 2. I could have picked a equals 5, I could have picked a equals 15, a equals 45, it doesn't really matter, just as long as it falls in these parameters right here. I just picked 2 because 2 is a smaller number, which makes it a little bit easier to work with. Okay, so we have picked our a value. That was step 2. Alright, now step 3 is where we do most of our computing. We're going to start by computing bo equals a to the m mod n. bo equals a to the m mod n. Okay, so I'm going to fill in those values. 2 to the 13 mod 53. Note it is 53, not 52. There is a difference. Okay, so this is equals 30, if you were to calculate that. So what I am asking when I compute BO is, is the following. Come on. If 
the computer doesn't freeze. BO, we want to know if it equals either positive 1 or if it equals negative 1. If BO equals either of these, it means that N is prime. I'll add probably. It's probably prime. I'm not totally sure, but whatever. The, the test says prime, yes. Okay, so for BO, if it's positive 1 or negative 1, it's, it's probably prime. However, our BO was 30. It is not a positive 1, it is not negative 1. So we have to move on to calculate B1. Okay, so how do we do that? From here on out, what we do is B1 is going to be the previous B, which is obviously BO, the one we just calculated, squared. And then mod N, as always. Now this equals um, negative 1 mod 53. So for B1, what we're asking is the same as before. Is it positive 1 or is it negative 1? However, the implications at this point are different. So positive 1 tells you that the number is um, composite or not prime. Negative 1 tells you that it's prime. Now I'll add probably again since it's not absolutely for sure. What did we have? We had negative 1. So our case was this. Negative 1 implies it's prime. Therefore, the conclusion of this problem is 53 is probably prime. And we have finished the problem. Now, um, that, that's how you work that problem. I'm going to expand a little bit if the problem had not been this short. So say, say you have a problem where b1 equals 5 or something. Okay, that's not positive 1, that's not negative 1. So what we would have done then is we would have computed b2, which will be 5 squared mod n in this example. And then b2 we're going to look at in the same way as b1. We want to know is it positive 1 or negative 1. If it's positive 1, composite. If it's negative 1, probably prime. So after b1, b2, b3, etc., b1 and on, we work in this same way. Um, where if it's positive 1, it's composite. If it's negative 1, it's probably prime. B0 is the only time where positive 1 or negative 1 imply that it is prime. So in general, we want to just keep computing um, until we get a number, until our result is either positive 1 or negative 1, and draw our conclusion from there. There are a few cases where you will never get that positive 1 or negative 1, um, if it just loops and goes on forever, that means it's composite, but that doesn't happen too often. So that is, in summary, how you use the Miller-Rabin primality test. I'm going to make a different video on how good the Miller-Rabin primality test is and how to uh, make it its best. So I'll put the link for that below.